headline figures, CPI, two, two and a half percent, retail price index, as you say, three, three and a half percent. That way. isn't really what's happening no. in the economy. Not, not in, when you look at industry and what yeah. we buy, be it raw material steel or components, hydraulic components, electric components, microprocessor shortages, booting prices up, the prices were crazy, logistics costs. Uh, a container from China was two and a half thousand dollars. Uh, at the end of last year, it's now eleven thousand dollars to ship a container from Shanghai to Europe. So all of those costs have got to feed through into the economy, and and yes, we're passing some of that onto our customers, and they're passing it on to their end customers as well. So that is just going to push inflation and price of building and and any even doing any sort of DIY at home. You try and get a builder today. You think that's the biggest threat to the UK economy now? Inflation. I think it is. I really do think, and I don't think it's just a UK issue. It's a worldwide issue. I think we, we haven't gone through a, an inflationary period for many, many years. And I, I think a lot of people can't even remember what it was like um, 20, 30 years ago, but I think we're heading back in that way. Money Talks often features tech entrepreneurs. The companies they build increasingly make a vital contribution to the UK economy. One such tech entrepreneur is Andy Hibbert, the CEO of CarShare, a company that allows ordinary people to rent out their cars to complete strangers by the hour, with customers unlocking and even starting cars using nothing but a mobile phone. It's a bit like Airbnb on wheels. As I get closer to the car, the phone connects the car through Bluetooth, so okay. there's no signal required, no phone signal. Okay. So that's all eradicated. This is now Bluetooth into the car. Okay. The functions to unlock and lock the car are now live. So if we unlock the car, you'll see it flash, hopefully. Fun. That's unlocked. Wow. That's just unlocked the car. So I'll get in the car yes. now. Car's open. Off we go. Wow. All through your phone? Yeah. What kind of market is there out there for ordinary people to let other people they don't even know drive their cars? Very good question. I mean, it, it, the business is a young business. Um, car sharing as a concept has been going since the year 2000, and I think you've probably heard of equivalents like Zipcar. The difference being their owner-operated car clubs. And after 20 years, I guess Zipcar's been going and driving that possibility to access a car. So the demand for cars is already very big for people who want to access a car. The, the, the change of mindset is around car ownership to car usership. And I think it's based on the simple fact that cars are used 4% of their life and so have a vast amount of time when they're sat on our streets and driveways just gathering dust. So Zipcar, the company itself owns the cars, but for car share, the punters, ordinary people still own the cars. Exactly right. So in the UK, there are 32 million privately owned cars in the UK. I think to put it in perspective, Zipcar possibly have a fleet of 4,000 cars in the UK. Wow. So 32 million cars use 4% of the time is a huge opportunity to make owners aware that they can now, in a really secure platform, share their cars to make money and help other people in their community nearby. Money Talks doesn't shy away from politics. We talked to many of the UK's top policy makers. Liz Truss served as a senior minister at both the Treasury and the Department of Trade before becoming Foreign Secretary just before the Conservative Party conference in early October. You said recently, we know from our history in post-war Britain, a bigger state ultimately leads to worse outcomes for everybody. We've now got the highest tax burden since the Second World War. Have we reached the limit of taxation in this country? Well, the best way to get our tax burden down is to grow the economy. And we need to absolutely go for growth. We need to reform the planning system, which Michael Gove is now leading on. We need deregulation, uh, which Lord Frost is doing a lot of work on. We need more trade deals, which Anne-Marie Trevelyan is working on. And we need to turbocharge the British economy. We are now, I think, one of the fastest growing economies in the G7. But there's always more to be done, because my view is that it's enterprise that's going to help us recover from COVID. And we need to reduce the restrictions on enterprise and help it thrive. Of course, you want to grow, and that lowers total debt as a share of GDP. And it lowers the tax burden as a proportion of GDP, and it lowers spending as a proportion of GDP. But the economy is stalling. I mean, the tax burden could go up a little bit before it goes down, despite what you, the Prime Minister, the Chancellor want. Well, none of us can predict the future. Even you, Liam, don't have a crystal ball about what's going to happen. 
But I am optimistic about Britain's prospects. I do think we're in a new position. We're in an unfrozen moment where we can do things differently. And I want to encourage all of us across the government to be bold in the next year or so about what we can do differently to really shift the dial and really unleash the ingenuity of British business and the British people. Isn't there a danger that the cost of net zero fall disproportionately on poorer households, on poorer firms? I mean, ahead of COP26, the government's putting this front and centre, the net zero agenda, but there are concerns now about the costs. But what, as I said in my speech earlier, the way to get to be greener is to be wealthier. And the way to get the innovation we need to tackle climate change is through opening up our economy, exchanging ideas, new innovations. I'm a big supporter of new nuclear. I think the small modular reactors are going to be really important to the energy solution. Like the ones being developed provide, by Rolls-Royce. Exactly, yeah. which I went to visit a, a few weeks ago and yeah. I think are a brilliant opportunity. So we need to turbocharge that innovation and investment. So what do you think we've learnt from the recent energy crunch? Well, I think we've learnt how important HGV drivers are. Uh, to our economy, and I think it's good uh, that people are being paid more to do those important jobs. Uh, the industry assure us that there is the petrol available at the refineries and the terminals, but obviously it's important to the British economy. The UK is home to thousands and thousands of small and medium-sized enterprises. Such SMEs are the engine room of our economy. My Money Talks interviews often feature SME founders, people who've set up a business, often started in their own home, working all hours in a bid to see their firm fly. One such micro-entrepreneur is Carol Maxwell, who used her graphic design skills to set up a fast-growing gift and greeting card business called Max Made Me Do It, named after her infant son. Are you mad? <laughs> Starting a business from your kitchen table? Well... What I possessed you? It didn't, that's just it. It very organically happened. And I don't think I, I ever said to myself, I want to have a business. Um, and maybe if I knew what I knew now, maybe I wouldn't have done it. But here I am, it organically happened, it organically grew. And I'm very lucky and privileged to be able to have a business to creating art, which I think is a quite a hard thing to do, and it's what I've always done since childhood. So. But it's quite a serious business now, isn't it? You've got staff, yeah. you, it makes money. Yeah. Um, it's not just a, a kitchen table hobby. You are now yeah. a card-carrying business owner running a profitable operation. Yeah. How did that happen? <laughs> uh, it's, that is a good question. <laughs> How did that happen? Um, I think in the early days, my business grew very organically through social media platforms yeah. like Instagram, which is obviously a visual um, sharing platform. So because my work is quite illustrative, um, I got quite a good following on there. People who kind of were in the same boat as me, a lot of young mums mm. looking for kind of nice things for their kids' rooms. And I was designing very reactively to what's happening to me in my life at the time. So mm. at that time, I was inspired by being a new mother, mm. having children and kind of wanting to find nice things for their rooms and that parents as customers would like as well. Did you have to raise finance at the beginning or did you fund it from your savings? Have you now got... A uh, production facility, or is it still all out the back of the house, if you like? No, um, I mean, initially it was literally a small printer at home. I was designing and printing cards myself, packing them myself, taking them to markets. Um, whereas now we've got a suite of like G Clay printers at my premises, which is a shop at the front in Forest Hill in South East London. And then we've got a studio in the back and a packing area where we run the online orders from. So it's definitely not me at the kitchen table anymore. <laughs> From business building in a London kitchen to full-on manufacturing on Teesside, John Elliott's a business legend in the North East. Having left school at 15, he's a serial entrepreneur, employs hundreds of people in County Durham, where his company, EBAC, makes washing machines, dehumidifiers and a host of other appliances. That's right, washing machines built on Teesside. I asked John Elliott if the UK is still a world-class manufacturer. We're a good manufacturer. We don't manufacture enough. I think you've got to be very careful about these sexy titles like world-class. Some of the boring stuff is what we really need. You know, some of this technology and this sexy stuff is the, the cream on the cake. Yeah. We need the cake first. What we need is basic things that you and I need. Yeah. Clothing, appliances, 
Those things are the boring things, not the yeah. high-tech things. That's what we need. Simple, skilled, but relatively low-tech in uh, the grand scheme well, of things. Yeah, but appropriate. Yeah. It's what we need, you see. It's more important to have food on the table, isn't it, than a faster laptop. Uh, you know, I think we've got to get things into proportion. We've just got to make more of the basic things. It's not sexy, but it's very, very important. Now, I know your company well. I've I visited your company. I think we've got some pictures here of your shop floor, some of your... Your, your several hundred workers. But when I say, even to quite well informed people, and there's no denigration on you, there's a guy in the northeast who makes washing machines. Yeah. They're like, really? A yeah. British? I made fun of it light hearted yeah. in, yeah. in the introduction. British made washing machines? Why does the phrase British made washing machine sound a bit weird to, well, to, it, to most people? It doesn't to me. <laughs> I'm uh, sure it we doesn't. used to make a lot of washing machines. Yeah. Some people still think washing machines are still made in the UK. The, the often made in Italy, for example. Yeah. It suits big business, you see, to go to Poland and then make a few more dollars. Yeah. Um, but we can make good washing machines. We do make good washing machines. And there's a demand for British-made washing machines. Yeah. But it doesn't mean that we can hide behind the flag. We've, it still has to punch above its... It still has to absolutely wash right. its face and your clothes. Absolutely yeah. right. It's got to do the job at the right price. Yeah. Um, we focus on reliability. That's our big thing. So we, we've designed one that's reliable. We haven't tried to design the cheapest washing machine in the world. We've tried to design the best washing machine in the world, the best value for money. Someone like Ricky Gervais in this country, he says whatever he wants and he doesn't care uh, about the... because the, the, he can't be cancelled. I still think that even he toes the line a little bit. He's, he thinks about it. I mean, I do think he considers it. You, you have to... You know, because the weird thing is... Like for me, like what I what I feel about what's happening right now. I mean, I feel like I could talk about it on stage because mm. I've, I've, I'm established. But I also think like, you know, if you're partners with, with uh, the biggest streaming service in the world, and then if you also, you know, you're doing a commercial for this uh, international company. and you do, So you have to think, you know what, how much do I really want to rock the boat? So I, I do think that sometimes I think people forget that, this is supposed to be an irritant. You are supposed to, as a comedian, you're supposed to be controversial. You're supposed to take the other side. You're supposed to get the audience to, to question their foundational thinking. That ability to look away and let things be yeah. is a sign of maturity. And behind closed doors, and this is what the racism of law expectations is about, is but those Muslims, they're just not there yet. The, that's really uh, what it boils down that's to. That's a really interesting point as far as that. Is it this expectation that Muslims are, are likely to react violently if they're upset? That's a very patronizing. Yeah, because the Christians isn't it? used to do that in the past. They're over it now. Right. They're old enough. They're mature enough. They're adults. The assumption is, if you're a Muslim, a drawing of the Prophet Muhammad, whether it's flattering or not, is going to offend you. Can you look away? Well, it's not necessarily true. That, that all Muslims would be offended? Well, first of all, it's not true. Yeah. That's, that's, again, why I think it's a form of racism and it's a form of, in itself, if you want to pursue the notion of Islamophobia, yes. <laughs> it is actually a form of phobia. You're watching GB News live across the UK and the world on our digital stream. GB News is Britain's news channel. We are the UK's home of discussion and debate from all perspectives. We are here for you. Don't forget to join our YouTube community by clicking on that subscribe button. And if you want the GB News app, you can click and catch up on programmes anytime. We love to hear from you, so email us. GBviews at gbnews.uk Thanks for being part of the GB News family. My name is Andrew Doyle. Join me every Sunday evening at 7 p.m. for Free Speech Nation. This is a show where we address current affairs and news stories of the week with the help of two wonderful comedian panelists. I brought in comics because I want to give it a lighter edge and also they work for less. See you there. Join my show, Farage, 7 p.m. till 8 p.m. Monday through Thursday. And there you will get opinion, analysis, debate. And I'll cover stories that nobody else dares to touch. And then for the last 15 minutes, talking pints. We're over a drink. We have a civilized conversation with someone. We very often disagree, but we do it in a grown-up way. Come and join me on Farage.
I'm Colin Brazier. I've reported from more than 70 countries around the world, covered wars from Afghanistan to Iraq, from Lebanon to the Balkans. I'm trying to bring that experience, that feel for events, to the studio. And something else, I'm ready to give an opinion. Today's stories with a spark. Brazier from 8 p.m. weekdays on GB News. Business is full of big characters like John Elliott. Another huge business personality, this time hailing from London, is Charlie Mullins, who also left school at the first opportunity, eventually setting up Pimlico Plumbers. The business grew to the point where Charlie was employing over 400 people with a hugely valuable brand. Charlie came to me having sold his business for a cool 150 million pounds. I asked him whether he'd been driven and commercially ambitious from a young age. You know, I started off with an apprenticeship and rightly, as you said, from Camden, Camden area and uh, never looked back. But of course, it's, it's been a, a tricky road there, you know, I mean, a few casualties on the way. But life is great now, you know, absolutely over the moon about it. So um... I'm sure you grew up with many entrepreneurial, energetic people at school, ju just as I did. But not everybody was able to have the confidence that gave you such success in business, such drive, such determination. Where does that come from, Charlie? Well, uh, you know, I had quite a poor background. Well, m you know, very poor, actually. But, and, uh, and I think the, 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 the will to want to sort of improve your life and get something out of life, that played a big part of it. And, you know, I was starting doing work when I was about nine or 10 years of age, all the odd jobs. And, you know, left school at 15 and, uh, you know, I look back now and I realise it was a big mistake. I should have left at 14 because <laughs> well, it was pointless being there if you know what you're going to be doing. And, you know, I was never that academic, but, yeah, I could work hard and had a lot of drive and enthusiasm. What made me different, what made me different from other people? I would say just the, 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 the enthusiasm uh, and the willpower to want to be successful in life. And the vision, right? The vision. Well, of course, you've got to have all the bits and pieces to, to, to get there and the drive. I mean, I don't know if you know, but I used to do sort of boxing and, and yeah. unfortunately I came out of that through a, an head injury. And um, my passion was boxing and then I just put everything into work. And, you know, I've had a great load of people around me. Many family members have been in the business and uh, made it the success it is today. Another business legend is Sir Martin Sorrell. After working at the iconic Saatchi and Saatchi Group during the 1980s, he built the world's largest advertising and PR group, WPP. Now Britain's best-known advertising man has set up yet another business, S4 Capital, focused on the digital advertising market, which now accounts for the majority of the world's multi-billion pound global advertising spend. I asked Sir Martin Sorrell if the way the tech giants and search engines track our browsing behaviour, then selling that information on, has become a little bit creepy. You're right, it did become creepy, uh, but I think now the regulation or regulatory framework is now being put in place where the platforms behave relatively responsibly. I mean, it's, there are still issues that have to be ironed out. And, you know, Google's decision, actually, I think was a really smart one to, to, to get rid of third-party cookies, which they took of their own initiative, because I think they saw the regulatory they, pressure they in saw Australia. They the wind was blowing, so... They, they were worried about Canada, they were yeah. worried about France, and they thought they would preempt it. Yeah. So, and the net result of it all is really quite interesting, because when, you, when it all sorts through the system, and in two or three years' time, when third-party cookies are dead and we have a cookie-less world, what it means is that the sources of data for personalization at scale, as we just discussed, become two. First party data, which clients control, yeah. consented data that you and I consented to use of, and we know where it's going. And secondly, the signals from the platforms, which you know, Amazon, Google, Facebook will see where you, you what, are, the where, sort of what, you, what, you're what you would like, right, yeah. et cetera. Yeah, but yeah. but you, again, you've consented to do it. Because yeah. Apple have taken the same view. So two of the leading companies, one a hardware company and one a platform, have, have, have sort of set the standards. GDPR here in Europe, um, I was on a call... Uh, the general with, data protection requirement. Yes. 
I was on a call with Vestager, who's the, the, the commissioner in Brussels, and um, somebody asked whether that was put in to limit the power of the platform. And she said it wasn't the original intention of GDPR uh, was not to do that, which I think, I, I don't think is quite accurate, if I put it that way. <laughs> I think it was done to do yeah. that, but it had the effect, it had the perverse effect, the law of unintended consequences, of limiting the growth and power of the medium-sized platforms and the smaller ones that were intended to, comp to compete. So a lot of those American platforms that yeah. wanted to come to Europe didn't do so because they said bureaucracy was too great. And, the and only the really big players could cope with the bureaucracy of yeah. the regulation. The irony so the was- the regulation it. actually stymied competition exactly. rather than promoting competition. Exactly, and I think that is a problem that the regulators are gonna have to deal with. And I think in the regulatory area, I think the net result of this will be that the platforms, the big six that I mentioned, Google, Facebook, Amazon, Tencent, Alibaba, TikTok, will not grow through acquisition. You may well see some deconsolidation. In fact, we've already seen that with Ant Financial and Alibaba in China. I don't think they'll get broken up here. If they did get broken up, by the way, it would make the ecosystem even more complex, which is good for us because it means that we can be in a position to advise on more alternatives, but I think it will limit the ability of those big companies to grow through deals through acquisition. Ahead of that COP26 summit in Glasgow, I wanted to understand the cost of tackling climate change to get a handle on where the costs would fall. Ministers have been vague on this issue, but with new petrol and diesel cars set to be banned by 2030 and gas boilers to be replaced by expensive heat pumps, there's growing public concern. I spoke to the lawyer and financial analyst Victoria Hewson about the sky-high costs of achieving net zero. Well, I think for a start, the numbers we're talking about are so huge that it's actually very hard for most people to, to get their heads around it and conceptualise it at all. So, for example, a common figure that gets used and is certainly favoured by the government when they pass net zero into law was £50 billion pounds a year. Till 2050. To, up to 2050. Now, that figure in itself isn't a particularly honest representation of what the Committee on Climate Change uh, actually said. But let's, let's just accept for the moment that the government put out this £50 billion That's more year. than we just spend, spend on defence every year. It's, it's getting on for what we spend on schools every year. It's quite a big number, isn't it? £50 billion pounds well, a year. Well, you often see it also represented in terms of percentage of GDP, 1% to 2% of GDP. That's quite a lot, yeah. uh, really, in terms of cost and also the opportunity cost of what we're not doing with that kind of uh, investment. And of course, when, when you put it into, into gross figures, we're, we're in the trillions here. So between yeah. now and 2050. When you add up those 50 billions every year. We're, we're up to one and a half, 1.7 trillion. Now, some analysts think even that is a massive underestimate and wildly over-optimistic. And some, uh, some economists have calculated figures that are double that, closer to three trillion. And the interesting thing here is that the, the government, the Treasury, has really been quite obfuscatory about this. Um, it took freedom of information requests in the last year or so to reveal that they plumped on the 50 billion figure because that figure from the Climate Change Committee was lower than their own modelling, which came out at 70 billion. I mean, again, we're just talking tens of billions here. It, it feels like an unreal conversation in some ways, but the, the, the Treasury deliberately chose to uh, focus on the 50 billion because it was lower than the 70 billion figure that they had come up with. Then it emerged that the Climate Change Committee's calculations, which had supposedly produced this 50 billion figure, were um, not disclosed. They weren't available to the Treasury or anyone else to check and no, interrogate. No methodology of how they got to their 50 and billion again, number. It took a Freedom of Information request to try and get them to publish their workings, to show their workings. And they resisted this all the way through appeals to the courts. So it's a very, very untransparent process. Now, to be fair, they have produced some more um, clear uh, workings now that people have been able to interrogate. But the point I'm making is, in 2019, 
when the May government passed the 2050 net zero target into law as a legally binding commitment, they did it based on these back of a napkin kind of calculations that Treasury officials hadn't interrogated. And certainly the, the parliamentarians, MPs, who, who voted on it did so without any scrutiny at all. Ahead of COP26, on the money held detailed discussions with leading experts on how we can wean ourselves off polluting fossil fuels like coal, oil and gas. One emerging technology, or an old technology re-emerging, is the use of hydrogen to drive cars, ships and even planes, either via fuel cells or by transforming hydrogen into so-called green ammonia. Now the Australian mining legend Andrew Forrest, who set up the Fortescue Mining Group, is convinced so-called green hydrogen created using electrolysis, with that process itself being powered by renewable energy, is the key to our global energy future. He told me about his long-term interest in the so-called magic molecule. I started to noodle with hydrogen when I was a kid, like and any other kid kind of amazed that you could take something out of water, something from water you could actually burn. I mean, how does that work? And then when you burnt it, it released a whole heap of energy and it went back to water. And I just thought, oh, mate, this is Harry Potter. I mean, this is too good, you know? And I just started to look at it more and more. And then about 11 years ago, Fortescue started to investigate hydrogen really seriously. Five years ago, five, six years ago, we started to buy technology as a plan B for hydrogen. Hydrogen's got this little issue, it's difficult to store and difficult to transport in bulk, but as ammonia, you can do all of that really. You can convert the hydrogen that you create into ammonia, which is a liquid, which then you can move around. Yeah, so exactly. You can, you just add a bit of nitrogen from the air into the ammonia, and honestly, per cubic metre, you're transporting as much hydrogen as ammonia than you would if it was pure hydrogen. It works super well. And so I thought, okay, so that's our plan B. Plan A might be pure hydrogen one day, but we've got a plan B, let's go hard. And at the same time, I thought, you know, I've got to dig under this environmental stuff. I've got to really seriously educate myself. I don't want to be this vapid, rich bloke with an opinion. I mean, I, I want to know about it. So I sent myself back to school for four years. Tough four years, actually, now that I look back on it. I was a PhD in marine ecology. And I thought that, you know, the problems of the oceans would be like overfishing and plastic, and they are. But the elephant in the room was global warming. And what that's doing to oceanic wildlife was just shocking to witness. I thought, oh, it's not going to be long before it does it to us too. And so I came out of that PhD and I thought, right, we've got to move away from fossil fuels. It's going to wipe us out. I mean, I'm, I'm seeing it firsthand with the oceans. It's going to happen here. You know, we've got to get after this hard, but with another fuel. And of course, our old friend, the miracle molecule came up hard, you know, go back to hydrogen. And that's what we did. As an entrepreneur to your fingertips, you've launched more there into the how, but I still want to know why. Everyone can see that ocean levels are rising, but are you absolutely convinced that climate change is happening because of man-made global warming? I think the worst things about global warming is what you can't see. I mean, you can see those, see those massive bushfires in Australia and California. You can see sea level rising. You can see all of the temperature variation. It's what you can't see which really worries me. You know, what I've seen is as the oceans started to warm, as the land started to warm, it started to release methane. Now we release a truckload of methane already with coal and gas, but as the world started to warm, there's greater and greater natural release of methane, which says, and science is all over this now and truly very worried about it, that we're gonna reach a tipping point where the world warms to a point where that methane emission just starts to go natural. And it's, and methane's really dangerous, right? I mean, that's where you get gas from, methane. Super dangerous, and it's 80 to 90 times more powerful as a global warming agent than carbon, which everyone knows about, but they don't know about methane. The world keeps warming, we hit this tipping point. Science hasn't determined where it is, but we know it's there. And we reach that tipping point, and we hit that point, nothing, nothing we can do from that point on will stop the world just warming on its own. Just keep warming, warming, warming. We don't know when that warming will stop accelerating, but we know it's gonna accelerate. So I knew from that point, we've gotta get out of here. We've gotta stop global warming. As the nights drew in this autumn, Chancellor Rishi Sunak delivered his latest budget statement. It was a big spending, high tax affair, and many complained it wasn't a conservative budget. 
To read the runes, I invited a former Chief Secretary to the Treasury to join me as my Money Talks guest, someone who knows the Conservative Party backwards, former Tory leadership candidate Michael Portillo. What Rishi has put forward is a high-tax, high-spend budget. This is what Conservatives have consistently argued against. It is not what they believe in. And more than that, most Conservatives are convinced that these sorts of policies are doomed to failure. It was cheered on the day. It may have gone down well in the Red Bull seats. But many Conservatives will fear that these, these policies will result in catastrophe, which is what they've always predicted. So it's not actually a Conservative budget that Rishi Sunak just delivered? No, I didn't think it was at all a Conservative budget. And there was this rather pathetic postscript when you talked about yearning for a low-tax economy. But uh, I think you and I would be very surprised indeed if he is able, either politically or economically, towards the end of the Parliament, suddenly to throw the gears into reverse and to start cutting taxes. No, it looks to me as though the economic policy for the rest of this Parliament, and indeed probably beyond, has been set. It creates problems for the Labour Party, there is no doubt. Difficult to oppose. Difficult to oppose, difficult whether they should now say that they're going to spend more or whether they should try stealing Conservative clothes and saying that we need to be a bit more careful. So problems for the Labour Party. But, but I still think that the problems for the Conservative Party are more striking. You're a former Chief Secretary to the Treasury, as I said, former Shadow Chancellor. You've put budgets together. You know that in the end it all revolves around the growth numbers. Rishi Sunak's betting on 6.5% growth this year and 6% growth the next year. Can Britain really grow at the same pace or even faster than China for two years in a row? Well, we're talking about growing from a substantially reduced economy as a result of the uh, pandemic. I mean, I don't know the answer to your question, and I'm absolutely sure the Chancellor doesn't know the answer to your question. But by and large, chancellors who bet on, you know, the, the, the outer numbers, the, 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 the best case scenarios, uh, don't normally do very well, because the best case scenario is not normally the one that's delivered. When the Bank of England failed to put up interest rates in November, many people were surprised. Inflation was well above the 2% target, and the Bank of England policymakers, including the governor himself, had signalled to financial markets that borrowing costs were indeed about to go up. But when rates stayed ultra-low at 0.1%, many people scratched their heads. Someone who came into the On The Money studio to do so publicly was former Chancellor of the Exchequer, Norman Lamont. I was surprised they kept them on hold. I thought there would be an increase. I think it's a very finely balanced decision, but my great fear is that interest rates are so low, they will just go up in baby steps, and actually it won't be enough to deal with inflation. And you've got a real problem that they've been so low that it's difficult to get them up to any meaningful level. Of course, in your day, you'd have just decided to put up interest rates, right? As Chancellor, that's the way it used to be, or as a kind of negotiation between the Chancellor and the Bank of England governor. They used to call it your successor, Ken Clark. It was the Ken and Eddie show, wasn't it? And then, of course, we had an independent monetary policy committee from 1997. How worried are you about inflation? The Bank of England now is predicting 5% inflation. That would be the highest since 2011 by April 2022. And an awful lot of credible independents are predicting even higher. Uh, I'm extremely concerned uh, about it. I mean, the Bank of England and indeed other central banks in the world have been saying this is transitional. Well, it can be transitional, but transitional, transitional can last a very long That's time. Right. <laughs> and uh, when, when, I mean, if you take, for example, the supply shortages, the supply chain shortages, many people are predicting and they cover a wide variety of things from commodities to components to chips. Many people are predicting that that could continue into 2023. So, you know, there's every reason to be uh, worried about that. And then there's the risk that inflation gets embedded, that everything else is influenced, expectations, wage claims, and so inflation goes higher. I mean, as you probably know, Tim Congdon is for forecasting that in the United States, inflation could reach 10%. Now, that's an Very outlier. eminent economist, former Treasury wise yeah. man from yeah. your era, yeah. no that, less. That's an outlier in yeah. terms of forecasts. But the fact that he's talking yeah. like that is, 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 is worrying. 
So that's it, my end of year roundup of Money Talks interviews over recent months. You can catch up with full length versions of these discussions and many more via my Money Talks interview series on the GB News YouTube channel, my Money Talks podcast, or via the GB News app. Catch me again, my On The Money show airs on GB News Monday to Friday at 1 p.m. This is GB News. I'm Liam Halligan, and that was On The Money. It's time to remind ourselves, there's always another winter. Canary Islands sponsors the weather. This is the weather. You're watching GB News live across the UK and the world on our digital stream. GB News is Britain's news channel. We are the UK's home of discussion and debate from all perspectives. We are here for you. Don't forget to join our YouTube community by clicking on that subscribe button. And if you want the GB News app, you can click and catch up on programmes anytime. We love to hear from you, so email us. GBviews at gbnews.uk. Thanks for being part of the GB News family. My name is Andrew Doyle. Join me every Sunday evening at 7pm for Free Speech Nation. This is a show where we address current affairs and news stories of the week with the help of two wonderful comedian panellists. I brought in comics because I want to give it a lighter edge and also they work for less. See you there. Join my show, Farage, 7pm till 8pm, Monday through Thursday. And there you will get opinion, analysis, debate, and I'll cover stories that nobody else dares to touch. And then for the last 15 minutes, talking pints. We're over a drink. We have a civilised conversation with someone. We very often disagree, but we do it in a grown-up way. Come and join me on Farage. I'm Colin Brazier. I've reported from more than 70 countries around the world, covered wars from Afghanistan to Iraq, from Lebanon to the Balkans. I'm trying to bring that experience, that feel for events, to the studio. And something else, I'm ready to give an opinion. Today's stories with a spark. Brazier from 8 p.m. weekdays on GB News. Good afternoon, I'm Polly Middlehurst and these are your GB News headlines at four o'clock. The Prime Minister is not expected to announce any further restrictions in England today to control the Omicron variant. Boris Johnson is being briefed on the latest Covid data by the Chief Medical Officer, Professor Chris Whitty. Tighter measures have been introduced elsewhere in the United Kingdom. However, so far Boris Johnson has resisted a similar move for England. This next story, just to warn you, does have some flashing images. And new restrictions on hospitality have come into force in Scotland to try to stop the spread of Omicron. Nightclubs are to shut down and social distancing will also return to bars, restaurants, gyms and theatres. Meanwhile, Northern Ireland will also have introduced similar measures, including the rule of six when eating or drinking out or with table service only. Stephen Montgomery from the Scottish Hospitality Group spoke to GB News and says the restrictions are taking a toll on the industry. It's a bit of a blow for us in a month that uh, would traditionally you know, give us 
most of our turnover, well, certainly 35% of our turnover for the year to get us through January, February and into March. And as well as that, it's the busiest time of the year. You know, Hogmanay in Scotland is one of the biggest celebrations you'll ever see. The Business and Energy Secretary has met with energy bosses to address rapidly rising wholesale gas prices. The chief executives of major suppliers met with Kwasi Kwarteng to discuss what the government's calling ongoing effects of record high global gas prices. Since the start of September, more than two dozen companies have gone bust. A government spokesperson says meetings between the sector and ministers will continue over the coming days to make sure UK consumers are protected. West Mercia Police has formally apologised to the family of ex-professional footballer Dalian Atkinson over his death. The 48-year-old who played for Aston Villa died in 2016 after PC Benjamin Monk kicked him in the head at least twice and tasered him three times. Monk was convicted of manslaughter and jailed for eight years in June. Chief Constable Pippa Mills said a police uniform does not grant officers immunity to behave unlawfully or abuse their powers. The Metropolitan Police is investigating a video linked to a man arrested at Windsor Castle on Christmas Day while carrying a crossbow. The video, obtained by the Sun newspaper, shows a masked figure addressing the camera and appearing to make threats toward the Queen. Police say the suspect has been sectioned under the Mental Health Act. Head teachers are worried that pupils who isolate because of COVID could miss their A-level and GCSE mock exams at the start of term. The Association of School and College Leaders says the mocks are high stakes this year as they could be used as backup if exams get cancelled. Almost 10 million children are due to return to school next week. Schools may have to consider a mix of remote and in-class learning if they don't have enough staff to cover classes. The jury in the sex trafficking trial of Ghislaine Maxwell in the United States has resumed deliberations today. The British socialite is on trial in America, accused of luring young girls to be molested by Jeffrey Epstein. The, last, the jury last sat on Wednesday before breaking up for the Christmas holidays. Miss Maxwell denies all the charges. And those are your latest news headlines. I'll be back in half an hour with more. See you then. It's time to remind ourselves, there's always another winter. Canary Islands sponsors the weather. Well, looking ahead to this afternoon in the UK's guess what? Cloudy in the south with rain moving east, but drier and brighter in the north. Let's take a look at that in detail. The southwest will be mostly cloudy this afternoon with limited brighter spells for some. There'll be showers. These will be locally heavy at times and a brisk west or southwesterly breeze. The southeast will be wet with persistent, at times, heavy rain. The odd dry cell is possible for a time and it will be mild. South Wales will be cloudy with outbreaks of rain. These will also turn heavy at times. It'll be breezy here but also feel mild. The northwest of England will also be mostly cloudy with hill fog lingering. Then patchy outbreaks of rain will gradually edge in from the south later in the day, feeling milder than of late. Northeast England will be drier, although still rather cloudy. Some bright or sunny spells are possible towards the north through the afternoon, with some outbreaks of rain possible in the south later. There will be a chillier feel for those of us in southern Scotland. It will also be a rather cloudy day, but the odd bright or sunny spell remains possible. Northern Ireland will be a little milder, but also rather cloudy. The odd shower is also possible, along with a few brighter spells in the east. It'll be rather breezy too. Remaining dry and clear in the north, the rain elsewhere edging east with showers following in the west. And that is how the weather is shaping up for the rest of the day. Canary Islands sponsors the weather. Hello, I'm Neil Oliver, and over the last six months, I've been fortunate to meet some fantastic people from all across the British Isles. Today, I'm looking back at some of my own personal favourites that helped define the term best of British. Now, regulars of this show 
will know that I love my history. And back in November, I met Professor Dan Parsons from Hull University. He's one of the researchers looking for remains of a town called Ravenser Odd that disappeared off the coast of Yorkshire all of 650 years ago. It was known as one of the main towns at the mouth of the Humber estuary before it was eroded and taken away for good in 1362. Now, scientists and historians reckon the found traces of it much closer to the shore than expected. It's being called Yorkshire's very own Atlantis. So, so, so Ravens at Odd um, was a was a town, um, quite quite a successful town for for a number of years. Um, but it was it was um, right at the mouth of the Humber Estuary, which um, is is a quite a precarious position to have a town, and I'll explain why in a moment. But the 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 the, the town slowly um, over time um, essentially um, succumbed to the waves um, and 